everyone. Today's guest is a dear friend of mine, Steve Sabosley, guitarist and vocalist for the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania band Punchline. Steve and I have a lot of history together throughout the years. Our paths have crossed numerous times on the road, most recently in April of 2019 when Punchline and Less Than Jake last toured together. Today we discussed arguably the most popular Punchline song, Universe. We dive into the inspiration and inception behind the song and how it went through numerous changes before and after introducing producer Mark McCluskey into the mix. We focus a lot on what Mark brought to the table production-wise and how his ideas took this song from being just another album track to the true hit that it is. Steve talks about why he feels the song resonates so deeply with Punchline fans and why he thinks it's the perfect set closer to their shows. And Steve tells me a great story about his bass playing bandmate, Mr. Chris Vefalios, prior to the release of the song that helped Universe reach the top of the iTunes charts. For all this and much more, stay tuned. Hey, hey, have you heard? Chris makes a podcast. Hey, hey, have you heard? Chris makes a podcast. Hey, hey, have you heard? Chris makes a podcast. Hey, hey, have you heard? Chris makes a podcast. For our listeners, uh, Steve uh, plays in Punchline with the show's producer, Chris Fafalios, uh, bass player extraordinaire for Punchline, and uh, been wanting to get you on for some time, so this is very cool. Awesome, man. Yeah, me and Chris, we started Punchline when we were in high school, and I can't believe we're still doing it today. I know, you're only 25, you know? It seems like it's been longer than that. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> I will say, I was trying to think... I want to say, gosh, 2000, 2003 action came out, right? 2004. 2004, okay. So it was around 03, 04 that I first uh, was hearing this buzz of this band uh, called Punchline from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, that uh, got signed not too long after uh, to Fueled by Ramen. And uh, it was such a, an exciting time, and we... We always loved you guys, you know that, and uh, you will. You're, you're still kids to me, which is weird because you're not kids anymore. <laughs> <laughs> We'd always refer to refer to you guys as the kids in Punchline. And Chris had talked to me about this song that we're going to talk about today called Universe, and uh, this track came out in 2012 on your EP called So Nice to Meet You. And wow, you know, from where you guys started, I mean, for lack of a better word, you guys were. A a pop punk band in the early days but uh you always had this underlying uh, lining thing of what i would call uh, pop sensibilities you guys were always a, a more of a pop band than than the punk edge and uh this track is just probably one of the most produced tracks you've ever uh ever released i love this song and i'm not just saying that this song is awesome and uh thanks man i'd, I'd like you to set this one up for us so um I know that there was an initial demo that you did for it, and then there was a uh, re first recording, and then you finally got with producer Mark McCluskey to record it. So uh, take us through a little bit of the evolution of the song. When did you first write it? This was first written in probably 2011. I want to say I remember that it was cold. The previous Punchline record was called Delightfully Pleased, which was more of a what I would call like a return to our pop punk roots. Um, as far as the songs go on that album, there were more of the songs that we wrote that we liked. And then after doing that album, you know, I started to think, yeah, but what if we had a song that could, you know, transcend the, the masses as every songwriter would eventually like to do one day. Sure. And I remember I was in, I was at my friend's house in Brooklyn, my friend Eric. He's a close, close buddy of ours. And he was going to the gym. I had been, had been staying with him. And he said, I'm going to the gym. Write something, you know, write, write a banger before I get back. So I had, had an hour and I sat there on his couch and I played guitar and I came up with uh, the, uh, the basics of the, of the chorus. So basically like the universe concept and hook if you will and then you know what's funny some songs pour right out when you sit down and write them and some songs take 
so much work. And in my in my past, I feel like the songs that pour themselves out and are just handed to you always turn out to be the best. But this song was actually one that we really had to to work for and push to get it to get it just right. And I, I really appreciate that about this song. I came back to Pittsburgh and we had been writing to go record an EP with this fella, Mark McCluskey, who this was the first time that we worked with him. And since then, we've worked with him on most of our stuff that we've done over the last almost decade. I love I love Mark. And so we, we got in a room together with the band and fleshed out the rest of the song. And then we went and we demoed it. And I think I, I did a demo beforehand that was just me and it was like a it was like a little more like dance poppy of a of a demo that I did with my friend Harrison. You are my you But it felt like it needed to rock. So we we went and we recorded another demo, like a full band demo at uh, Innovation Studios in Steubenville, Ohio, where we had recorded Delightfully Pleased. And it's funny how many demos there are for this song. I don't think we've ever had so many demos and alternate versions of songs as we do for for this song. And it felt so good to play this as a as a rock song it's that nice like four on the floor beat they they call it sure So the demo felt felt great, and then we went out to L.A. to record this song with Mark, and it was in downtown L.A., which I don't have a lot of other memories from being downtown in downtown L.A., but it smells like pee. <laughs> and I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> I can. Do you, I, do you agree? I can vouch. Yes. <laughs> nice. <laughs> So we recorded this at this this studio in uh, in Mark's house. We did the drums at Grandmaster right, Studios. I, right, I have that in my notes real quick. I'd like to say that uh, we recorded our, yeah. our The Lesson Jake recorded Borders and Boundaries at, at Grandmaster Studios. So that's really cool. Oh, nice. Yeah. Well, what a beautiful studio. Yeah, I remember seeing on the walls that I think Tragic Kingdom was recorded there. And... I believe that Foo Fighters Color and the Shape was recorded there. Dave recorded the drums there in that garage to get that big sound. Yeah. Yeah. And nice. and that was another selling point while we while we wanted to go record there. But uh so then you you did the you tracked the drums at Grandmaster, and then you went back to Mark's. Now does he have a studio in his house? Yeah, it was a like a loft studio. And he had two little two little dogs that were chihuahuas. And we started putting this song down, and he he said, you know, this song's called Universe. Let's make it sound spacey. <laughs> and what when you listen to, I mean, it's a really common sense thing, you know, make a song that's kind of about space sound like you're in you're in space. Well, well, hold, you're well, hold, hold on. Another nod to downtown LA. <laughs> well, hold on. I got to stop you there, Steve, because you're Please you're, do. you're 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 saying everything that I want to say. I have the word spacey written in my notes here, okay? Everything you're saying, I'm, I I want to get to. So that that's funny that you that's why I laughed a moment ago when you said spacey because that's uh that perfectly sums up this song and and it goes along with the title of universe. I think that's awesome. Nice. Heck yeah. So, this is where the work comes in. On this song, because up until this point, it it was it was it was a walk in the park, and Mark said, "I got to be honest, 
the lyrics that you guys have for the verses of this song are weak. And I think that you should revise them to be a little more direct. And this was a really big, a really big turning point, I feel like, in punchline lyric writing and lyric writing just for, you know, us as individual songwriters, which <laughs> was kind of, kind of the, the aha moment where we realized our lyrics can be a little too encoded sometimes and a, and a little less story like, which I think I went a little too personally. I think I became a little bit too, um, be, be very clear with what you're singing about. And now years later, I feel like I've dialed that back and just really appreciate songs that are not more, not more vague, but more like cryptic lyrics. So I think I've found a balance for that more recently. But Mark was like, why not make this a story about, um, you know, that, that revolves around, like has a little more space context. I love the imagery in this. I love, and, and we're going to get into the lyrics in a moment, but I do want to say, uh, you know, the, the song, and I want to, again, I want to get to Mark McCluskey too, because I just feel like the production on this, and, and, and something you said earlier, you mentioned that, that some songs, the best songs just come right out, and that's been a running theme on the show. You know, most of the artists I've had on have said, hey, this song was written in five minutes, but it's funny. Right. Not that this feels belabored in any way, but I... I could tell this song took some time. This song takes you on a journey and all from the verse to the chorus to the bridge, it changes feels. It, it was, it's not, it's not linear at all. And I heard your demos that you sent, your original demo and the other one, and they had mm -hmm. more of a linear feel. They were more of just like the, this song. Right. And this takes you on an adventure. And I think that's really cool that this was uh, labored over, but at the same time, it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel like there's too much here. It doesn't feel overproduced. It doesn't feel like it's over the top for me. It just, it, it works all together in context. It's great. Awesome, man. Thank you. I feel like, you know, when Mark told us to revise the the lyrics for it, I remember we went up on the the balcony of the, uh, there was a terrace on top, on the top floor of this apartment building and we were just all sitting there not together kind of going off into separate corners and coming up with with ideas for lyrics for me as a as a songwriter i like writing with with other people but i have a really hard time coming up with words to songs with people like okay chris now let's write this next line together like we'll come up with this next line together that seems crazy to me i'm much more like all right you go over there i'm gonna go over here you come up with the best you've got let's meet back here in like 15 minutes and we'll see you know who's got the goods so we did a whole lot of a whole lot of that and 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 that's really that that whole wait until you know that you have it method of songwriting really has has stuck with me i feel like now nowadays I, if, you know, a part doesn't feel right, you just got to think about it longer. You got to find the thing that makes it right. It's like balancing a checkbook or solving yeah. a math problem. Well, and, and some, sometimes you have to step away from it too, I feel. Totally. You know, totally. You have to. totally. But that's the best feeling when you finally figure it out and in your head, you see, okay, it goes from this part into this next part and it feels so natural and feels like, you know, you found out how the song goes. I just love that. And something else, you know, before we get into to lyrics, just about the music that I really noticed with this song is that when we play this song live, something about the arrangement, you know, what the drums are playing, what the bass is doing, what the guitar, what the one guitar is doing, what the other guitar is doing, how all of these things come together was uh, another aha moment where I realized how, I mean, obviously arrangement is important and where everyone is playing what on their, on their instruments, but it was an aha moment where I, where I realized, wow, when you do this right, 
the song just connects with people more and and you can play you can play one song live and you can play another song and the song that is arranged better is going to sound like your amp sound better it'll make you sound like your better guitar players it'll make you sound make it sound like there's a better sound engineer and I just I, I I love that. Yeah, no, I can I can fully relate to that. It's funny how you you'll sometimes record songs and you'll be convinced as a band this is the greatest thing we've ever done, and you go play it and it falls flat in a live setting, and you you can't figure out why. And then you'll play a right. song like Universe, and it's just it has everybody dancing and everybody moving. Um, you know, and a lot of that, and there is kind of a science behind hit songs. They have that uh, right BPM to them, beats per minute, and uh, it just uh, there's kind of a formula to. It. And at the same time, I don't think there's really a formula to this song. It's an interesting uh, arrangement that uh, I'd like to get into. And before I do, though, I would like to ask, was this song written about a love interest? Was, was it, or is it just a story that uh, you kind of made up? It was written about a, I don't know if I would say, you know, retroactively, I don't know if I would say a love interest at the time. I think I had hoped it was a was a love interest. It's a whole other, you know, cra- crazy, crazy story. But I had I had gone through a a breakup, which was a nasty breakup, which all worked out in the end because I just married her, and so I pivoted upon this breakup. I pivoted to this uh, this love interest that was a girl from California who I had this phone relationship with, but I had never met her. So that's kind of what the song is about. It's like you're out in space all alone, and you can only talk to this person on the phone. Gotcha. Okay. So the song opens up, and it's interesting. Uh, you talk about that spacey thing, and uh, the, the song, there's not a lot of songs that, that can have bells in them that work. And the bells in this song, where, <laughs> well, the, 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 the bells in this song where, where they are placed are haunting. The chorusy guitar, spacey effects you have on the guitar. I love this intro. And, you know, I have verse one here, but this is this is almost like its own setup here, this intro. And we get into the lyrics here with, um, I've been floating in the night sky on a ship that's stuck on standby. Your voice reminds me I'm real. I made a choice and now I wait here, orbiting the earth for five long years, our lives like magnetic fields. So was this something that you had originally or just something that was bore out of the sessions with Mark, how he was, you said he was pushing you for lyrical uh, imagery. That's right. This was, this was conceived on the, uh, the rooftop at his, uh, at his apartment. Cool. We had completely scrapped. I don't think we really kept anything from the original, from the original demo in the, in the verses, maybe in the bridge though. Well, and immediately when the song starts again, it has just these the, these spacey guitars. And then the second half of the verse, when it goes to I made a choice and I wait here line, this sample like snare drum hits come in. I made a choice and now I wait here. Orbit in the earth for five long And it's very, you know, not what I would say rock. It's a very pop, pop sound and it just works. And then you're into the first chorus, which the band doesn't all of a sudden come in. And now it's completely broke down. There's no drums uh, until the very buildup of the chorus. The bells are there, though. The bells come back for the first chorus, uh, which, again, they're just perfectly placed. And they just, you know, it was funny. After I listened to the song a couple of times, I went back and I, I said, I wonder if the, if the bells weren't there, this song would not make me feel the same. Whose idea was it to incorporate the bells? Was that something of production that, that Mark wanted to do or some, uh, someone in the band suggested? I, I'm guessing that it was Mark, but it's funny that you bring that up about the bells because here at home, when I'm recording, I have a Logic Pro template that I use for my sessions and every template has, has a bells track <laughs> already there, locked and loaded, baby. <laughs> it's so, I want them bells. It's, They're right there. It's so funny. I, you know, I think my band, I think we've written 240 original songs or whatever it's at now. We don't have bells in any one of them. I have bell envy now, Steve. So I'm going to find a song. You got to get them 
Tubular bells. That's what you need. Yeah. Tubular bells. Who doesn't need a tubular <laughs> bell? Um, so we we get into the first course, and I it's interesting because, again, I was thinking when I heard this song that this is just going to lift, you know, and it kind of breaks back down. And you say, you are my universe. You are my universe. And I'm just a planet. And I can't stand it. And I love that. The following the imagery again about being spacey, the universe, you know, the universe is infinite, uh, which is hard to comprehend. And you're just a planet in that universe, you know, but the other person, this, you know, lady is, is the universe. And that's just a, uh, that's awesome. It's funny though, because this song, it's very, it's very dated in some regards, because this was prior to the discover the scientific discovery of the multiverse. Ah. So, you know, nowadays when you say somebody is the universe, it's almost kind of a, kind of a diss, well, you know? Well, I'm thinking of a 2021 updated version. You are my multiverse. <laughs> <laughs> you got to redo it with more bells and more whistles. Um, we might have to, but, uh, this lyric though, from listening to the demo that was there that was in place you are my universe and i'm just a planet so that was really something obviously that that you guys and mark loved it was the verses that you really wanted to get uh more locked with that right that was the 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 chorus those lyrics that was the original nugget that was that was born on the couch in brooklyn and the uh the chord progression of of the chorus is that classic one five six four, you know, fundamentally C G A minor F. Yeah, I'm sure you know it. it. We're all very familiar with it. Absolutely, it's uh, you know Blink One Eighty Two. Uh, uh, <laughs> the uh, uh, what's my age again? It's Hit or Miss, New Found Glory. It's Rest of My Life, Less Than Jake. It's Green Day, When I Come Around. It's a million songs, but man, it's just a feel good riff. And and here it works. Right. It, it, here it works so well. And when I was playing through it last night, I loved the. It's interesting. The the riff is is simple in context, but it's everything else that you guys and Mark built around this track that doesn't make it feel simple, if that makes sense. Right. Heck yeah. Yeah. No, Heck yeah. No, I, I, I love that about it. And uh, the production of this song, like I said, it just takes you, takes you on a ride. Um, after the first chorus, uh, that at the very end of it, and I can't stand it, the drums just get really exciting. And the song kind of uh, explodes at that point. And I can't stand it. And you got the spacey guitars, and, and you have a reintro of what the top was, but now it's the full the full band's in. And then we get into what uh, you could either call verse one. I'm calling it verse two here. Uh, my only link left to humankind is the only one that I want on the landline calling mission control what if this is a black hole uh again the the imagery there of space <laughs> black hole mission control the, i i was i was reviewing the uh the the demos for this last night and the original black hole line was suck me in like a black hole which to me like made me almost spit my drink out when i heard that <laughs> i just thought that was really was really funny yeah okay so so was that was that something that the the guys or Mark wanted changed, or you you realized that that wasn't the right? You wanted to keep it a little more, uh, you know. What if this is a, 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 I, I say a little more uh, vague, not as descriptive? Right, right, right. Yeah, black hole was one of the original space themed words that was was in the was in the song, and then we kept we kept the black hole word, but we changed the phrasing on it. And you know, I'm really happy that we did because. Suck me in like a black hole just feels feels like a creepy thing to say. Before we go any further, I do want to mention, and, you know, as uh, journalists out there, we always get pegged, you know, like Less Than Jake was a, a ska punk thing and, and this and that. But, you know, you have to, you know, kind of give examples of other bands to. But this song, man, there's just so many things I love about it. First of all, it's got that 80s feel, and I'm a sucker for an 80s pop song, a complete sucker. Uh, but I hear elements in here, a little bit of just your vocal delivery, especially at the top of uh, Death Cab for Cutie. I hear some Jimmy Eat World in here, like from the Futures record on from their career. Um, what were some of, were those some of the influences with this or was just this something that, that, that came out or, or were you consciously thinking of any of that? I mean, Death Cab 
Jimmy World was probably my favorite band from 2000 to 2007. And Death Cab was probably my favorite band from 2008 to 2014 or something okay, like so, that. So I'm, on, so, so I'm on to something. You know, I'm on to something here. There. I'm on to something here. Okay. For sure. Okay. For sure. And, I, yeah. and, and again, I don't mean that in any way as like it's a, a rip of those bands or anything. I just hear it in there. I hear, no. I hear a little bit of U2 in here, uh, just production-wise. And that's something I want to talk about real quick in terms of production. Up to this point, do you feel this was your most produced song? Because this... This thing just sounds amazing, you know, and I could I could hear this on pop radio and um, I don't know if you ever uh, thought of this, but uh, I could hear about 30 different bands off the top of my head re- recording this. So you might want to shop this to a band to record it because this song is is it, it, to me uh, it, to me. It's a hit. It's 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 amazing. Thanks, man. Thank you. Uh, yeah. If we know if anybody out there wants to show this song to you know, a famous pop artist to recut it, please, please do. That would be, that'd be really cool. I would, no, I was meant, I was mentioning about the production. So do you feel that this was the most, uh, oh, right, right, right. El- Sorry. no, 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 no problem. This was the most elaborate production up to this point that you had, because like I said, this just, there's a lot going on here in this song. You know, you could strip it back to just, uh, you know, when I was playing on an acoustic, I'm like, okay, this is a pretty simple arrangement chord wise, but man, it's everything else that's going on that doesn't make it feel simple. We were really excited about working with Mark McCluskey because of his composition background. And I feel like he's very good at taking rock music and making it very interesting by adding ear candy and just knowing what to do with all the tones. The producer that we had worked with on the, you know, previous couple albums were more producers who wanted to make us not make us sound like a punk band, but make us sound, you know, more like we do playing the songs, you know, live in a room. Not that they didn't have their own, you know, production elements, but this was a calculated choice on our part to want to work with somebody who had more of this you know composition background and was gonna do all the all the ear candy well and i always talk about how songs make me feel uh rob cavallo uh who was green day's producer who worked uh i've worked with him before on a less than jake record rob always talked and it was the first time i ever heard this he always talked about how a song initially made him feel and it's interesting. I thought about Rob when I was listening to this song, and I was like, "Man, if you really stripped this song back, and it was just another rock song that that you know, punchline or whoever were to record, you know, I'd like the song. But it, it's really the production elements and all the crazy guitars and just the sounds, the bells, everything here. It just all uh, it all works together perfectly. And if it wasn't there, it, to me, it wouldn't make me feel the, the way it does. Right? Yeah. Our our guitar player at the time uh, was was Paul good good buddy of ours he's kind of been in and out of punchline over over the years and i remember recording guitars on this song and on the ep it took not not days but it took a there was a lot going on guitar wise and a lot of time spent perfecting the the guitars and that the riff that ends the song it's like it has a lot of delay on it oh i just love that riff and how that carries out sounds like a signal flying through space (laughs) and that's chris's cue to play the song right now a snippet of that part (laughs) perfect god he's good um oh it's funny i sent chris I, i i sent you guys a folder that has the all i like track down the 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 demos and various recordings for the song but i did not put the remix there's also a remix for this song I don't know. I don't know about you, Chris, but I'm sort of the archivist in our in our band. That when something needs dug up from the olden days, I'm I'm, the, I'm your guy. No, I, I could see that. I listened to everything you sent in the folder, and I appreciate it. And uh, oh, nice, nice. So something I'd like to get into now is what I'm calling 
the only pre-chorus in the song. There's a departure after verse two. So you say, what if this is a black hole? And then it goes into what I'm calling a pre-chorus. It's the only time that this happens. And it says, do you think we'll ever meet? And would it change everything? When she asked me how far we can take it, I tell her we can take it across the entire. And then we get into the the second chorus. So uh, was that there in one of the, and I'm, I, I'm trying to think, I only listened to the demo version once. Was that there uh, in the initial versions of the song? Or was that something that uh, you, the band, or Mark, or someone felt that we need to take a little departure here before we get into the second chorus? I think that was there originally, which makes sense because... Older punchline songs, verse two is different from verse one. You know, there's more sharp left turns, which I still like. I still like that. I think back then, you know, it was kind of like, hey, you got a part idea? Let's put it in. Oh, you got another part? Yeah, let's tack it on. And so that, yeah, the second verse was was always that way. I'm, I haven't really thought about the structure of this song in a long time, but you're right. It's really... It's really strange, and we're getting there, but it I got to give some foreshadowing because I don't want to catch anybody off guard. This song ends with a verse. Oh, no, no, we're, we're going to get there. I got it in the notes. <laughs> stop, tell, t- stop giving it away, Steve. Jeez. No, no, you're right, and that's, again, I, I said it earlier, that's what I love about this song. It's very unorthodox, but at the same time, you can fit it categorically into what I would consider a pop song. It's not some weird abstract song, but there's there's some uh, twists and turns with this one. So after what I'm calling the pre-chorus, we get into chorus two, and it's a uh, universe. You are my universe, and I'm just a planet, and I can't stand it. But I am humble to be in your, and then it doubles, and it says it says it again. Uh, the double chorus. Uh, this is all a full band here. Uh, the second half of it, it's the same lyric as the first, but the second half, the bells come back. The bells weren't there in the first half. And again, that's just a production thing. I know I keep talking about them, but it's just, it's so cool. It, and you and I didn't even notice it till I went back and listened to the song like two, the second or third or fourth time. I'm like, wait a second, the bells aren't there the first half of the course. And it's just those little things of ear candy that make this song special. Do you remember any of that talk when you were getting the mixes back? Were the bells there or not there? And, and, and some of the production stuff and you're saying, wait, why aren't they there? Or do you, do you remember that at all? Well, I I just know that the the guitar hook, the mm-hmm. you know, that was a big part of the of the song going in. So I think we just wanted to keep reminding people of that part and tucking that that melody in there, which I'm guessing that that's that's what you're saying sounds like a little U2-ish. You know, it's not that it sounds like Bono, but we got a little bit of the edge in this song. No, you you, you do. And the, and just the, <laughs> the, the production reminds me of Steve Lillywhite's production, Steve, that did all the U2 stuff. I mean, he's just, he's fantastic in making stuff sound atmospheric. Uh, he did that record, uh, Kings and Queens by Jared Leto's uh, band. Uh, why am I blanking on the name? Uh but uh, 30 seconds to Mars. Thank you. 30 seconds to Mars. Uh, that song Kings and Queens is just massive. And Steve did that song. And that uh, the, again, when I first heard this track uh, universe, I, I immediately thought of, of U2 production wise with all the spacey guitar sounds. And again, I've always been a been a sucker for, for that uh, that type of stuff. We get into the bridge now. And man, I love this bridge. I love uh what uh what Corey's playing here on the drums it's so exciting it's so good so this wasn't the first record that Corey played on but the previous record, he came in, you know, the the songs were already written, basically. And so this was the first time putting together songs with Corey. And, I mean, he just crushes it on the drums. And I love it when, when song ideas l- allow him to just kind of run wild. Some grooves, some grooves and beats and tempos just really allow him to to like fly off into the night. And I, I love it. This is definitely one of those. No. And, th- and this is another part of the song that and I wrote in my notes here. I put <laughs> great, exciting drumming, but not overplayed. 
perfect for the song. That was my exact notes I wrote here, and, and that's so true. Uh, this this part's heavy, man. This bridge is heavy for and for this pop song that you've created here i was you just don't expect that twist and turn it just comes in and it, it's just heavy it's big uh, i also wrote down uh the synth part here uh is is that a, a spacey guitar effect or is that actually a synth part like the that that whole thing that comes in there i think what you're talking about it's a, like a bendy guitar okay okay and that just makes that part adds that oh that perfect tension to it yes i love the bend. i love the bendy guitars yeah no that uh, again this this departure of this bridge is great and and the the melody of course because it's a bridge it changes i you know i'll bet you never saw it coming and and i'll i'll bet you never saw it coming but it's so nice to meet you and uh it kind of goes through a measure of the bridge and then this crazy drum fill and then it goes through the second half uh so it's it's kind of it's not really that long but it's a a little longer of a bridge upon first listen you're not expecting it to go to a second half but it just it just works perfectly and then you get into chorus three and i love the last 30 seconds of this song it's i think in from a pop standpoint of songwriting and a hit song it's perfect uh it breaks down again uh it's not really just a guitar uh like arpeggio guitar or something breakdown part but there's lots of spacey uh phasey type production going on it breaks down the drums aren't there uh the lyric is you are my universe you are my universe and i'm just a planet and i can't stand it and then at the end of that there's this drum build up and boom you're into for the first time in the song you go halftime the whole band I can't stand it You are my universe You are my universe I'm just a planet And I can't stand And the drums are breaking down There's the ride cymbal going And this, so for chorus three, this is the part two of chorus three. You are my universe, you are my universe, and I'm just a planet, and I can't stand it. But I am humble to be in your world. And boom, now we kick into the third part of of the chorus. I am humble to be in your world. The whole band's in. It's no longer uh, uh, halftime. It's double time again. I'm so humble to be in your world. Then, what you had mentioned a moment ago, it goes back to the first verse, which is brilliant. And it just wraps up the song. Now the bells are back in. The whole production, the the hook guitar from the beginning of this song is in. Uh, and again, you reiterate, I've been floating in the night sky on a ship that's stuck on standby. Your voice reminds me I'm real. Your universe. And uh, you end on that E flat, that suspense chord that gets me every time. I love it. Your I can't believe this song ends with a verse. Whoever whoever does that. It, I think that that must have been Mark's idea. I can't imagine that the demos end end that way. Um playing this song live, the halftime part. Oh my god. We always close with this song, you know, over the years I feel like this song has shown itself as a as a favorite among among fans and it just feels so good and full and warm to play you know play as a as a closer but it all it's always a little you know we had to modify the very end because it ends with that verse which isn't you know it's anthemic and then it goes into this you know takes this left turn and then ends on this suspense chord (laughs) and i think for a while when we when we were playing it last people didn't realize that the song was over or that the set was over so we changed it to end on it. It still ends on that, you know, on the same chord. But then we do these, you, go to, you know, big hits. Oh, okay, multiple, so you go like to the to the. Times. You, do you end? Do you do the big hits on E flat, or you, do you do, do it in B flat? We do it on the same chord as on the record, and then some years, some years, <laughs> it's like evolved over time. Sometimes we then resolve it and end on the on the. I think it's a whatever the key of the song is in. We end it on the one chord. Yeah, B flat. Yeah. 
Yeah, and then there are other, you know, some years we keep it as is on the on the record. Or or A sharp for those music enthusiasts out there. Yeah. Um <laughs> Yeah, we're still trying to trying to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Uh so man, I and I've said it before on the show, I'm a sucker for the suspense cord, and I'll tell you what I love about going back to the verse, Steve. What I love so much about it is that and especially hitting that suspense chord. I always say that the sp- suspense chord is like a cliffhanger and you got to go back to the episode. I love that it ends on the verse because how, again, how it makes me feel, especially the first time I listened and fully digested this song, it made me feel like the whole song, it sounds weird, bear with me here, the whole song was kind of like a dream and you're going back to the beginning and, and you're, you're still just floating in the night sky. You're on a ship that's stuck on standby. Your voice reminds me I'm real. And you got to listen to the song again. And then it just keeps kind of going. It doesn't really have an end resolve to it, as evidenced by the suspense chord at the end that never ends and resolves the song. Uh, I, I love the way, again, that it makes me feel. It's, it's, it's a great pop song. It's got a little bit of a Christmas vibe. <laughs> I think that's probably the bells. Yeah, yeah, it kind of kind kind of uh, ha- harkens to that for sure. That's an interesting point. I didn't even think about that. So, do you remember? You know, I know you talked about this being a set closer. Do you remember the first time that you guys uh, you guys played this, and what was the reaction from from Punchline fans? So over time, I feel like when you come out with new music, it's taken. I realize now that when we release records, that it takes fans you know, up to five years to really see how they feel about albums, oh, and yeah. new, you know, newer, newer albums. But I think people really got behind this EP right from, right from the jump. It's kind of an interesting circumstance. We spent, I want to say $0 on marketing this album. It was totally self-released, independently released, we had been sitting on this recording. I think we recorded it in the summer of 2011. And we had it pretty much ready to come out. And we were planning the release. And we played this show. It was right after right after Christmas that year. We went up to Long Island and played this, this show. And it was the worst show. And, and I don't mean... I don't mean the crowd was bad or the venue was bad, which they weren't they weren't great, but that wasn't that wasn't the the bad part. What was bad is we were bad. We played really badly. <laughs> like I mean it was a blessing in disguise that we played that badly. Sometimes, you know, it takes falling on your face to realize, you know, what what you're doing, what you're doing wrong, I guess. But that drive home after that show we beat ourselves up in in such a in such a good way and really really came together and said you know what let's let's release this ep let's get this thing together and release this you know like not tomorrow but you know in the next couple days it was like decided within a week that it was going to come out a week a week later which is awesome that you can do that in you know in this day and age and i never expected the reception that we had that we had from it. So we put together, we scheduled the, the EP to come out, you know, a week after that. It was like within the first couple days of, of January. I think it came out January 4th of, of 2012. And Chris, that day, the day that the EP came out, he, he wrote this note and took a picture of it. This is Chris, Chris Fafalius, producer Chris Fafalius here, wrote a note and took a picture of it. And the note said, if our new EP doesn't go to number one on iTunes, which at the time iTunes was the, was the thing, you like Spotify is the thing. Now, if this doesn't go to number one on iTunes, then I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit the band. And he was very simple, a picture of that. He posted it and... It started getting so many comments and you know the i i saw this just like everybody else this wasn't like this wasn't a situation where we had this idea as a band you know for marketing reasons that chris was going to write this note and 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 post it online and and sort of break break the internet so i saw it on you know facebook just like everybody else 
And I called him and said something along the lines of, what the, what the hell are you doing, man? You know, what are you, what are you talking about? And he explained it to me, and the way he explained it, you know, made a lot made a lot more sense, you know, once he went into the story, which was there it's so hard to make it as a as a band, even when you've had some successes under your belt, but to to continue to stay relevant and keep the audience behind you when you know, they have, you know, there's so much new music coming out all the time. And now that it's 2020, I mean, it's even, there's probably a hundred times more new music coming out every day yeah. than there was then. And the message behind his his note was, hey, if you want us, Punchline, this independent band to keep going, you got to, you know, we, we kind of need your support to keep going. And it really, it was a really polarizing note and that the comments got this, you know, a discussion going about, you know, that sentiment behind it. And some people were saying, you know, this is crazy. This is a gimmick. And other people said, you know, you know, he's right. Like, let's support Punchline. We want them to keep going. And when the song or when the EP came out, our fans got so behind it that it got the EP to uh, it wasn't number one on iTunes, but it was number one on the iTunes rock charts and we cracked the top 10 overall. And I have this screenshot of the iTunes rock charts where it's punchline number one, the Beatles number two, Metallica (laughs) number, (laughs) number three. (laughs) So we were there for, we didn't, we didn't hold on that long. It was three days. I think that we were number one on there, but it was so freaking cool. And it was a totally, punk rock DIY effort and I just fell in love with our with our fans even more. Oh my god, they're 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 the best. Yeah, no, that that's awesome. And and ultimatum or not, it's it's a great story. It brought and unified your fans and the proofs of the pudding. There's over uh, 1.3 million streams on Spotify for this song, and it's a great song. And people uh, people need to hear it. So uh, check out Universe by Punchline, and we're gonna check out Universe by Punchline right now because Steve has decided to share a strings version of Universe that he recorded, which actually features Katie Morrow. From from the band String Machine, which was the first ever band you might not know uh, on our podcast. So without any further ado, here it is, the Strings version of Universe. Floating in the night sky On a ship that's stuck on standby Your voice reminds me I'm real I made a choice and now I wait here Oh, I've been in the earth for five long years Our lives like magnetic fields Are my years I'm just a planet And I can't stand it Yeah My only link left to human Kind is the only one The one on the landline Calling mission control if this is a black hole Do you think we'll ever meet And would it change everything When she asked me how far we could take it I tell her we could take it Across the entire universe You are my universe And I'm just a planet And I can't stand it Just a planet
Dude, that was awesome. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing. That was uh, really special that, that, you, that you did that for us. Uh, uh, really appreciate it. And I really want to thank you for, for taking the time out to, uh, to talk about this track. Ab- absolutely, man. We weren't sure, you know, what song, what song to do. And I, I, I saw that someone else had said on, on the internet yesterday, you know, Chris DeMakes, you should have the Punchline guys on to talk about heart transplant. And but I'm glad that we're doing Universe. I think Universe is is the song. No, this this song uh, this song is great. And it actually, in fact, it it makes me want to uh, seek out and work with Mark McCluskey. I think he's a fantastic producer, and he brought a lot to the table with this song. It's uh, it's just uh, again, it's a fantastic uh, pop song. Steve, I'd like uh, like you to uh, plug anything you have going on in your world, solo, punchline, or anything else. Let the listeners know what uh, you've been up to. We just came out with a new song, a new punchline song called "Be Right There." You can look it up on Spotify, YouTube, Apple Music. There's a lyric video on YouTube. And also, we're very excited that we we put together an hour-long, I guess you could say it's a film about Punchline called The Punchline Music Special. And it's not a concert, but it has a concert element. It's not a documentary, but there are some documentary elements. But you know, it's neither of those. It's a music special. And it's just all these little tidbits of what we've done over the last couple years put together. And it took a it, it took a minute for us to to make it, but I'm so happy that we put together what I think is a solid hour of television for you to watch with your family. And you can look it up on Amazon Prime. It is out right now. Awesome. That is great. Uh, and where can people find, uh, find Steve online? So you can find me, Steve Sabosley. I'm going to spell my, my, my last name. Actually, I made a little song to spell my last name <laughs> for, uh, yeah, it's a, for it's, anybody out there. Y- your last name's a little different. I'll give you that. Yeah, it is a little, it is a little different. Check out this little song. S-O-B-O-S-L-A-I, Sabosley. So that's how you spell my last name. So yeah, <laughs> find me online, Steve Sabosley, all one word, S O B O S L A I, and then Punchline. It's uh, all our handles are Punch Lion L I O N dot com, um, and we look forward to uh, to hearing from you, everybody. Rock and roll. Well, hey man, thank you so much, and uh, have a great rest of your day. Yo, thanks, Chris. I really appreciate all the love and support you've given to Punchline over the years. You've absolutely been a a mentor to us, and thank you for that. Hey, everybody. It's your producer, Chris, here. I hope you all enjoyed that conversation between Chris and my bandmate and buddy, Steve. Uh, Since Steve and I are in the same band, I got to make demands of him before he came on the podcast. And one of my demands was, Steve, if you're coming on the podcast, you have to do your own version of the Chris Demakes a Podcast theme song. So uh, here it is. of the show here's a band you might not know 
Welcome to this week's Band You Might Not Know. If you'd like your band to be considered for Krista Makes a Podcast, all you have to do is submit your song and bio to bandyoumightnotknow at gmail.com. This week's featured band is Vipers from Schittsburg, Pennsylvania. They play punk rock and they despise the system. They've unfortunately been banned from performing live, but you can still listen to their album Spread the Poison on all streaming sites. Members of the band are Piss Chastise on vocals, Dink Nerdner on bass, Peanuts on drums, and John McNichols on guitar. Here's a snippet of their song, PMFA. When I'm 45 I don't know if I'll see 63 But if I do I'll be the punkest motherfucker alive Yeah The punkest motherfucker Yeah The Rap with Chris and Chris so, Chris, I really know that you are the host with the absolute most because I just heard you break down a song by my band, and that was such a cool and strange and awesome experience. And now I want you to do that for every Punchline song. Will you just do it for, for our entire catalog? <laughs> we got like a couple hundred songs. You could just go through all of them if that's cool. And I got to tell you, uh, the, it, it was so hard to resist talking shit about you. I just, you know, <laughs> it took every every bit of being. Now, that was that was a lot of fun, Chris. Uh, that I, I meant it. The song is great. That song is awesome. Well, I really appreciate that, man. I have a lot of fond memories, a lot that Steve talked about in this episode. I remember being up on that rooftop in LA and going off in our separate parts of the roof and brainstorming lyrics and coming back to each other. That's a fond memory. And one of the fondest memories that I've ever had in Punchline was the reception from our fans to this song and this EP. That was like a really amazing time uh, in the history of our band. And uh, another thing that Steve talked about in this episode that I 100% agree with is how awesome it feels to play this song. Not only it shows, that feels great, but also just at practice. This song just clicks everyone's doing their thing and it just feels great to play this song together with my friends and uh that led to something i wanted to ask you if you had to pick one less than jake song that just feels so good to play with your bandmates what would you choose uh <laughs> there's a couple of them uh we have a no rehearse rule for johnny quest we we've ne we haven't rehearsed that song in probably 20 years uh, no matter how long we haven't played together it could be uh could be three months we you know and we're gonna go play a show we're just gonna wing it uh and and it, just because it's so familiar but i'm gonna say you know to answer your question i'm gonna go with all my best friends or metalheads that's just one that that just clicks every time we play we played it so much and especially live when we play it uh, it's kind of a no-brainer you know the audience is gonna gonna go crazy and it's a it's a great feeling yeah man i i would agree with that from a listener's perspective that that one just feels good to listen to and to see you guys play live so good answer <laughs> and uh you know otherwise in this episode you know steve's my bandmate so i i think he covered enough about universe <laughs> for for the both of us for the entire band but uh, i would just say one more time if anyone out there hasn't heard punchline before then i I would say a good place to start would be the new song that we just released. It's called Be Right There. Just search for it. It's on every streaming site. It's on YouTube, wherever. Just search for Be Right There by Punchline and head to Amazon Prime because the Punchline music special was just released. It's an hour long. 
basically a hangout session with us. You can get to know us. And I would hope that if you don't know us, you'll feel like you do once it's all said and done. So yeah, I would stress that once again. Check out Punchline B right there and the Punchline Music Special on Amazon Prime. And uh, I hope that something about those things resonate with you. Well, and speaking of resonating, Chris, uh, I want to thank each and every one of our listeners for supporting this month's fundraiser. Uh, you can check it out at KristaMakesADifference.com. Yeah, man, for sure. Uh, hope for the day. It's a great cause, man. Yeah, hope for the day uh, promotes uh, suicide prevention and mental health. Uh, uh, you know, together we can explore the intersections between music and mental health, uh, and we can normalize talking about mental health and remember that it's okay not to be okay. So please, if you can, go to ChrisToMakesADifference dot com uh, to donate. Uh, they're they're a wonderful cause, and uh, they're who uh, we're featuring for the whole month of November. So if you could. Uh, Stop over there, KristaMakesADifference.com, and give whatever you have. We'd, we'd greatly appreciate it. Yes, you should absolutely go to KristaMakesADifference.com, and you should also go to LessThanJake.com right now. Chris, tell them why. Chris, you are the Segway master. I got to <laughs> give it to you. Every oh, yeah, week, man. every week, you just, you just, you know the right time to do that. Thank I do you. Do my best. Yes, yes. Please go to lessthanjake.com where you will find a direct ticket link to our live stream, Late Night with Less Than Jake, our first ever live stream uh, that will air live December 11th at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, it's going to be awesome. Go there. There's a different uh, packages. You could just watch the regular live stream. There's a VIP package with behind the scenes and extra footage that we're going to be offering. So, so, uh, yeah, we're, we're very excited about this, Chris. I think people are excited about it, too, man. I feel like I've seen a lot of people asking you to do that, and I feel like you've had to like keep your mouth shut about it for a while. <laughs> now, now you're doing it, man. Yeah, we've been wanting to do it for a while, but this year's been a little, uh, little weird, as we all know, and the record was supposed to come out a couple different times. It's finally coming out December 11th. The album's called Silver Linings, and we wanted to wait to uh, launch the live stream with, with uh, launching the record, so it's the perfect time. Again, go to lessthanjake.com for a direct ticket link where you can uh, uh, purchase tickets to our live stream and we uh, we hope you do it's going to be a lot of fun and uh, that's about it for today I want to st- uh, want to thank Steve Sabosley and Chris from Punchline uh, for being this week's guest and uh, and talking about the song universe it's been a lot of fun uh, if you haven't already please join the Chris to makes a podcast Facebook group and uh, get in there it's free to join it's a lot of fun and uh, we'll see you next week 